Good morning, everyone. My name is Ryan McEachran. I'm the Managing Director of uh, the Mine Suppliers Trade Association of Canada. And uh, I'm uh, very pleased to welcome everybody to our first of our three series of panel discussions. And I have the great pleasure of being able to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, uh, Sarah. And so if I can take a few moments to do that introduction. So uh, good morning again, everyone. Um, I would like to, before we dive into the program, uh, you'll hear from Sarah Wilson, uh, the Chief Com Trade Commissioner and Assistant Deputy Minister of International Business Development at Global Affairs Canada. Sarah is responsible for the Réseau de Services des Délégués Commerciaux et dirige une équipe de plus de 1,000 experts en faire dans plus de 100 bureaux uh, L'estranger uh, partout au Canada procurant, procurant <laughs> des uh, services aux entreprises uh, canadiennes à la recherche de la nouvelle possibilité d'exportation. Uh, so, uh, excuse my French there, everyone. Uh, Sarah Wilson has over 26 years of experience in the federal government. She has extensively served abroad at the uh, Council General of Canada to South, Amer South Central United States, based in Dallas, as Trade Program Manager in New Delhi, India, and Counselor at Canada's uh, Permanent Mission to the World Trade Organization, Geneva, and at Global Affairs Canada Headquarters. Prior to her current role, Sarah served as Director of Operations, Foreign and Defense Policy Secretariat at the Privy Council uh, Office. So it is my great pleasure right now to hand over uh, the microphone to uh, Sarah, Sarah Wilshaw. Thanks so much for that introduction, Ryan. Really appreciate it. And welcome everyone to the first event in a three-part series of live panel discussions called Innovation Sessions. The mining industry transformed how Canada is shifting industry norms. And let me also extend a warm welcome to those joining PDAC from abroad. En collaboration avec l'Exportation et Développement Canada et le Mining Suppliers Trade Association, cette série mettra en lumière les entreprises canadiennes qui testent les limites de l'innovation minière et façonnent l'avenir de l'industrie. The series will take place over the course of three consecutive days, starting today, March 8th, International Women's Day, and running from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern. I am delighted to have the chance to set the tone for today's panel by sharing just how Canada is shifting traditional mining norms through innovative and disruptive technologies and how the Trade Commissioner Service, or TCS, is a part of a network of catalysts for companies breaking ground in the industry. Aujourd'hui, plus que jamais, le service des délégués commerciaux du Canada aide les entreprises canadiennes à se développer à l'étranger en les mettant en contact avec ses programmes de financement et de soutien ses possibilités internationales et son réseau de délégués commerciaux dans plus de 160 villes du monde. Canada's well-known strength in mining is reflected by the number of mining companies we have in our client base. Over 1,200 Canadian companies are export-ready and active, with over 1,300 services delivered in the last year alone by the Trade Commissioner Service, or TCS, network. We are so proud to stand by and serve the companies who are innovative and who are disrupting mining, who are providing new solutions to advance efficiency and health and safety, and we're proud to bring Canadian talent to the world. Comme le monde de nombre d'entreprises présentes cette semaine à la conférence de l'Association canadienne des prospecteurs et entrepreneurs, l'exploitation minière est un composante majeure de l'économie canadienne. In 2019 alone, Canada's mining sector contributed $109 billion to the economy and accounted for 19% of Canada's total exports at $106 billion. And while the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted the financial outlook for this year, the mining industry responded swiftly, showing great resilience, and this has helped tremendously in managing the crisis both in Canada and abroad. Canada is a world-renowned uh, country for its leadership in science, technology, and innovation. We're seen as one of the most innovative and competitive economies on the planet, and we're particularly known for our mining innovation, collaboration, and expertise. As one of Canada's leading industries, mining is full of opportunities for international organizations looking to do business with Canadian companies. And as I said before, 
COVID-19 has had a huge impact on the mining industry as well. Like everyone else, they've been forced to adapt quickly from delivering training to employees virtually to incorporating novel technologies to improve efficiencies such as sensors, drones, and wearables. Technology companies across Canada are in a strong position to seize these opportunities and to gain traction with global mining operators by offering solutions focused on adding connectivity, optimization, forecasting, and analytics. Through the development of Canadian technologies and products that will reduce waste, lower costs, and mitigate environmental impacts all across aspects, various aspects of mining, our highly advanced and responsible mining practices are changing the face of the industry worldwide, and we have a lot of Canadian companies to thank for this. The mining industry is transforming at a faster pace than ever before, and mining companies are pursuing various methods to overcome challenges that help them to survive and thrive in this era of disruption. To that end, clean technology, artificial intelligence, and smart mining are already driving changes in the Canadian mining industry, creating greater production efficiencies, reduced environmental impact, and workforce safety. We are confident that Canada will remain a destination of choice for investment due to its diverse and rich in abundance of mineral resources, a stable, favorable tax regime, top performing economy for businesses, and highly educated and competitive workforce. As such, we will also continue to welcome foreign investment because we know it's a crucial tool for stimulating economic growth, job creation, and innovation. C'est dans cette perspective que nous vous encourageons aussi à vous prévaloir du soutien de, que le service des délégués commerciaux qui, que peut vous donner pour mettre en valeur des, les solutions minières nouvelles et innovantes que vous voulez exporter vers les marchés internationaux. Nous pouvons vous aider à tirer partie des accords de libre-échange à obtenir du financement grâce à nos programmes CanExport et à vous fournir des conseils spécialisés pour vous aider à croître sur les marchés internationaux. N'hésitez pas à contacter nos délégués commerciaux dans un de nos bureaux régionaux situés dans tout le Canada et à visiter notre site web à l'adresse suivante, déléguéscommercial.gc.ca pour commencer. That's Trade Commissioner .gc.ca in English to find us. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you today, and I invite you to get involved in our interactive TCS business development program here at PDAC and to reach out to us at our TCS booth on the virtual convention floor. J'ai maintenant le plaisir de vous présenter notre première séance sur l'innovation intitulée Les géosciences redéfinies. Today's panel discussion is led by Pioneer Exploration Hyperspectral Intelligence and Stratum AI, three great Canadian companies that are looking at geosciences a little differently than their predecessors. They're bringing a new angle to a transforming industry. So please join me in welcoming our moderator, Amanda Truscott, the co-founder and CEO of Advanced Analytics for Predictive Maintenance Company, Rhythmic Solutions. Bienvenue, Amanda, et merci à tous et toutes. Thank you all and enjoy. Thank you very much, Sarah, for that wonderful introduction. I'm delighted to be here and to introduce you to our panelists today. From Pioneer Exploration, we have Kia Parvar, Senior Geophysicist, Andrew Gagnon Andram, Geophysicist and Field Operations Manager, and Mac Evenden, who is their VP of Operations. From Hyperspectral Intelligence, we've got the CEO, Dr. Michelle Tappert. And from Stratum AI, we've got co-founder, um, Farzi Yusuf Ali. <laughs> I'm going to give each of the companies a few minutes for a brief introduction to who they are and what they do before we dive into some questions. So let's start with Pioneer Exploration. Thanks so much for that, Amanda. Um, as she mentioned, I am Mac Evenin, Vice President of Pioneer Exploration. Mike Burns, our president, could not be with us today because he is out of the country uh, with some spotty Wi-Fi at the moment. I believe uh, Kia will be uh, sharing his screen in our presentation. There we go. Thank you so much. So uh, next slide, uh, Kia, please. So Pioneer Exploration was actually founded by Mike Burns in uh, 2014 and was the original creator of the drone mag system. That system flew the, fl the first commercial drone mag flight in Montana that led to a major rhyolite-hosted sapphire discovery. 
We have come quite a ways since then with our team having experience flying aer aeromagnetic drone surveys as well as LIDAR surveys in over 10 different countries and on four different continents. Photos on the left show Mike in Oman in one of our first drone mag missions, while the wintry uh, photos on the right there show uh, us some of our operations just this past season. Next slide, Kia, please. Compared to the historic way of collecting Aeromag uh, data, drones offer many beneficial alternatives. Originally, Aeromag data was collected via manned helicopters or fixed-wing aircraft, which was expensive, sometimes unsafe, and, and usually produced data at a lower level of detail. If you wanted highly detailed da data, you would conduct a ground survey. These surveys could take quite a long time, employ a large number of people, and would only amount to 10 to 20 line kilometers of data each day. By taking the human pilot out of the aircraft, the drone mag surveys reduce risk and increase the overall safety of the survey crew. Drone surveys can be conducted during the daytime or at night and can collect up to 200 line kilometers of highly detailed data per day. I'll let Kia continue. Okay, thanks, Mac. Hey, Pioneer, we do, uh, do you deploy uh, gem system as a potassium vapor magnetometer with minimal noise range and um, capable of being used in areas with extreme gradients. This allows us to fly virtually anywhere uh, on the planet, even in uh, extreme magnetic inclinations like uh, um, in uh, Arctic regions. Max surveys are quite sensitive to any changes occurring uh, to the sensor to bedrock distance, and this uh, makes the proximity of the sensor to the ground extremely important. Deploying sensitive sensors and sometimes gradiometry, which means uh, using multiple sensors at once, is one way to overcome this issue. But uh, at the end of the day, it's always better um, to fly as close as possible to the target. This becomes even more important uh, if the line spacing is tighter, which is mostly the case for uh, UAV-based surveys. How we really make an impact uh, on the way that airborne servers are conducted? Well, UAVs are capable of flying closer to the ground without putting the crew in the, uh, serious danger. Uh, sweeping the tree lines and uh, flying close to the targets is now possible by deploying UAVs and flying according to the high-resolution DEMs in addition to using active sense and avoid systems. Comparing our UAV capabilities with previously flown surveys, over the same area reveals our advantages and to a degree disadvantages, basically because uh, um, UAVs yet are not capable of uh, covering uh, uh, regional areas and just like they're not really suitable for regional surveys. Um, and flying regional surveys are much more affordable with helicopters and fixed wing platforms still. For example, the helicopter survey that was flown in 2007 over a, a much larger area in order to target some major structures, um, compared to um, what we did uh, 10 years later than, uh, in 2017, uh, we were given like the highlighted area here in the, in a corner um, to uh, um, conduct a UAV magnetic survey over um, over that to reveal more details on the structures of uh, interest. This survey was uh, conducted as a request of uh, Silver Standard Resources uh, in order to um, uh, detect some uh, details on the structures for their drilling targets. So by dividing the line spacing of the helicopter survey by four and the elevation height by 5.3, we managed to reveal much more details on the given property. As you can see, in fact, the client was able to hit many more targets after drilling uh, based on the UAV data provided to them. Well, as expected, the inverted data was also showed, uh, also showed the default zones, which were uh, virtually impossible to detect by, uh, by the helicopter survey. Um, due to the limitations uh, that it had in terms of the elevation and line spacing. And of course, high, uh, higher spatial resolution achieved by deploying the UAVs were also affected or affecting uh, the, the 3D inverted data. The depth at which certain structures were disappearing or making contacts uh, with the other structures is now much clearer 
and sharper and uh, are, are shown with higher details. And uh, this uh, for sure makes a noticeable difference when it comes to um, choosing drilling targets. Uh, I'll let uh, Andrew continue um, this one. Perfect, thanks, Kia. So with our advancements in the last two to three years, our drone-based surveys can fly ext extremely tight line spacing along with closer terrain following, which allows for much greater detail on the final data set, as well as being a comparatively green product with very little environmental impact on the survey area. We've been able to decrease system noise in our data, and we are currently testing new sense and avoid systems to aid in flying as low as possible while avoiding hazards and obstacles. Pioneer was the first drone-based company to join IAGSA, or the International Airborne Geophysics Safety Association, and complete our BARS aviation risk standard. We plan to continue to push the boundaries of this technology and apply it towards collecting the best possible data in the safest and most environmentally conscious manner. In addition to continuing advances in magnetometry, we're also actively conducting LiDAR surveys from airborne and UAV platforms. The ability to collect high resolution point cloud data, even through heavy vegetation cover with extreme accuracy and precision is a valuable tool for topography and surface modeling, as well as infrastructure inspections. The ability of a UAV to get closer to the target allows for increased spatial resolution, as well as additional scanning angles that are not possible for a manned aircraft platform. And here is what we have on the horizon. We've been working to develop new data solutions deployable from our UAV platforms, including multispectral and hyperspectral imaging, radiometric sensors, and even VLF electromagnetics. These are not just theoretical, they're all in development and we'll see commercial deployment in the near future. Radiometrics is a technique we're particularly excited about. What we're talking about here is a UAV mounted gamma ray spectrometer for measuring radiation. Typically, this has been used in mineral exploration industry to measure radiation from trace isotopes of potassium, thorium, and uranium, which are naturally occurring in the ground. This data is used for surficial mineral mapping and especially for uranium exploration. Here, we are fairly limited by the detector crystal volume, which is the bottleneck for these UAV applications. A bigger crystal means higher detector sensitivity, but it also must be lighter than a standard airborne sensor in order to be feasible as a UAV payload. Specific industry applications where the UAV solution truly shines here is in detailed glacial dispersal train mapping, so looking for uranium-rich boulders scattered by glacial movement, as well as for radiation contamination surveys for environmental applications. We've had a lot of success with testing these methods on hot samples of uranium-rich rocks in the field. We're also beginning to offer hyperspectral imaging solutions to our clients, which has many mineral exploration applications in areas with limited vegetation cover. The benefit of using a UAV here is that we can safely fly lower than a manned aircraft, which increases spatial resolution. We were an industry partner for an NSERC Create research project this summer, which has helped us to develop a detailed methodology for backend data processing to ensure that we're providing the highest quality of data to our clients. Uh, thanks for listening to us talk. Uh, I think the key takeaways we'd like to leave you with are that we're using UAV technology to fill a niche in the exploration industry that was not possible before recent advances in drone technology. Our UAV surveys are safer and in many cases more cost effective compared to airborne and produce high quality data. Thanks again for your time, everyone. Thank you very much, gentlemen. And now let's hear from Michelle from Hyperspectral Intelligence. Hello, is my screen on? It sure is. Okay, um, right, so let me share my screen and I will give you some slides. Are you now able to see my presentation? Not yet, sometimes oh. they take a second oh, to show sorry. up. Sorry. There we go. All right. Yes, so um, my name is Dr. Michelle Tapper, and I'm the CEO of Hyperspectral Intelligence, and I've prepared a few slides here to give you an introduction to our company. First, Hyperspectral Intelligence is a Canadian company based in British Columbia. We have three main co-founders, and each of the co-founders has a PhD in geology. We all met at grad school at the University of Alberta, and since then we've been working on hyperspectral data acquisition, hyperspectral data 
interpretation, and processing techniques. Because we're geologists, we were really focused on using hyperspectral techniques to identify minerals and rocks accurately. In order to do this, what we've done is we've designed the Geologer Hyperspectral Rock Analyzer. And that's what you're seeing here in this picture. So what's the, there's, you know, innovation's great, but what we did is we wanted to innovate for a real purpose. And that main purpose was to identify and help with the automated drill core logging of drill core. So one of the main problems that is with the um, logging of drill core is that humans are subjective observers. And as a result, the drill core logs they produce contain inaccuracies, inconsistencies, oversimplifications, and emissions. And the only way to remedy this is to collect compositional information in a continuous manner from the drill core. Otherwise, inaccuracies in drill core logs can lead to project failure and even mine failure. And there are several examples of this in the literature if you want to look. So when we designed the geologer, we had a few goals in mind. And first, we wanted to be a robust instrument. Here you can see its extendable frame, its sensor head, which contains the sources, the light sources, the cameras, and all the other instruments it requires. And then there's a removable mast. So it's important to know that the geologer is actually a tool for automation. So therefore, it needs to have access to the internet. It's a cloud-connected instrument. And with that access to the internet, they we can perform remote diagnostic, we can help with training, and also there is the ability or requirement that data are uploaded to the crowd, cloud directly from the instrument. This allows us to um, provide customized and rapid data processing um, tools as well. So another thing about the geologer is that it's very flexible. It can be used on the floor, it, um, and it can scan uh, drill core boxes of any size up to 1.6 meters. And for people who don't want to sc um, scan on the floor, you can place it on a table, run the drill core under the table, um, either manually moving the boxes or having it over top of a roller table. Another feature of the geologer is that the, the hardware is quite compact, which makes it quite easy to ship. So you can truck it to a location very easily. It's also been flown multiple times around the world. And because of that compact design, the instrument is actually quite easy to use. And therefore, training right now is provided remotely to the operators who have been selected to use it. And then this, this um, training can take half a day or an hour, depend, or not half a day, or an hour, half a day or a full day, depending on how many operators are being trained to use it at that particular location. And then once that um, the operators have been trained, then they are able to then use the instrument and upload the data to the cloud. Um, for example, the geologer can scan between 250 and 300 meters of drill core a day. That data produced by the geologer in that amount of time is about 11 gigabytes. Um, it's important to know that about 90% of that data will be from the high resolution digital photographs. And when that data is uploaded, depending on how long the upload speeds are at the location, then it goes to a secure data repository where it is then processed. So um, let's look at some of the outputs that the geologer produces. So as I mentioned before, it has a um, camera which produces high resolution drill core photography. It is a line scan, continuous line scan camera. So the pictures um, have no stitch marks and the camera currently on it has a um, pixel size of approximately 35 microns, which allows for high resolution, the output of high resolution photos. For companies that would like a higher um, resolution, we can also put a different camera on that can go down to about a 15 um, micrometer uh, uh, pixel size. So here are some examples of the photographs that we collect. These are mainly from sediments, but the geologer analyzes a full range of rock types from mafic igneous to sedimentary, as well as from felsic to mafic rocks. And so on the left-hand side, you have a dark gray rock, which is no problem for the geologer. And on the right-hand side, you have something with a higher bit of variability. All of the images that are produced by the geologer are ready for um, importing into third-party visualization software. So what we also produce, and this is the main main feature or the main advantage, is the are the geologic um, compositional logs that are produced. And so this is the, the real um, benefit of using a hyperspectral system. So what you have here are three um, drill holes, one, one, two, and three. And there are four columns in each, each figure here. You've got a spectral log on the left, you've got a clay log, a waste rock log, and a lithologic log. And the spectral log 
What you can see here are different colors. Each of those colors relates to a distinct mineral assemblage. So within a drill hole, you're able to identify distinct mineral assemblages. But where the real advantage comes in is that you're then able to identify that exact same mineral assemblage in other drill holes. So here on the left hand side, you see there's a, a purple unit or a purple mineral assemblage. And on the right hand side, you can see in that third log that there's that exact mineral assemblage also located in the drill core. And so this allows for not just um, identification within drill holes, but between them to facilitate accurate correlation between units. In the second column, um, there's a clay metric that measures the abundance of clays. This is important for several downstream processes. In addition, there's a waste rock metric. And finally, there is a lithologic log where all of this information is used to build a, um, a log that identifies the different compositional units. The outputs produced by the geologer are customized for each customer, and therefore these results would be output as required by the customer. So you may have different needs, and therefore your logs would probably be look a little bit different. And another uh, key point here is that the um, outputs, as well as being figures, they come out as um, CSV files that are ready for import into 3D modeling software. So the idea is that Everything is very quick when you collect the data. It's quick to collect data, quick to get it analyzed, and then the results are then easily imported into the modeling software that is then used to make decisions. So finally, um, I've got four advantages of using the geologger. First, you can improve waste uh, resource estimates with more accurate drill core logs and better deposit models. You can increase extraction efficiency with a better understanding of rock composition, ore grades, and other rock properties. You can save money with lower scanning and data processing costs, fewer people on site, and more strategic geochemical sampling plans. And you can save time with optimized data transfers, rapid result turnarounds, and a seamless deliverable integration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michelle. And last, certainly not least, we'll hand it over to Farzi from Stratum AI, and then we'll get into some questions. Thank you everyone. Good morning. Forgive me, my voice is a little gone today, so if you can't hear me, please let me know. And I'll quickly share my screen. Perfect. Can you see my screen? Just a last check. Yeah, looking good, sounding good. Go for it. Perfect. Thank you so much. So we are Strata, and what we do is use AI to produce better resource models for every single mine operating. So I want to start off by talking about the biggest challenges for mining company by separating them out to the various data available at each stage. So with drill holes, they directly affect your mine planning. With blast holes, they directly affect your grade control, and with the mill, you get your reconciliation data out of it. However, if you don't have a good resource model, then these inefficiencies, inefficiencies propagate to every single mine process, being mine planning, work control, and the mill blood. So what we've done is created a more accurate model for mine planning and grade control using AI with the data you already have. The way we do this is quite, to explain it very simply, what we do is we learn the geology from higher density data, which is your blast hole and mill data, and then create a model using your lower density data, which is your drill data. We leverage learning the geology from all of these different data sets to recover the value in the mining process dynamically and throughout the, the life of the mine. So the way we actually deploy this model is quite simple. We train them. We train the resource model on historical data and then deploy to the mine. We then you create a data pipeline where we integrate new data like drill holes and sampling to then be logged in the system. By having access to that data, we create an almost continuous feedback loop where we can update our resource model every two to three hours. We always integrate with our domain experts both on the our side and the client side to make sure that the model is meeting quality standards. So rather than explain how exactly it works and how 
theoretically it would be deployed. I'm just going to give you an example. This is a mine in, in Northern Ontario, standard gold mine. It has a production history of 20 years. This is an end of life mine. It has a lot of drill hole samples and a cup and a, I think a little less chip samples to work. So the, the, the use case for this particular mine was to help with our brownfields exploration. Since it was end of life, we wanted to be able to extend that end of that life to be able to find satellite deposits and plan accordingly around them. What we did was we actually created a guided drilling program where we would not only find new clusters, but also guide the drills to find the most appropriate location to drill to hit the most clusters uh, perpendicular to the actual cluster itself. So these are so this is where it becomes really interesting. This is the predict this is our prediction. This is the creaking model that they produced. And this is the data that was available to build those models. We can use the same data that the mine already has to produce a much better model. So with this one mine, what we were able to do was identify a larger economic area, which was equivalent to $168 million in situ. But we also predicted, we also uh, allowed for less deviation in the quarterly predicted tonnage by 75.4%. This was a market improvement over what they have because we had we had much more confidence in what was in those in those new satellite deposits because we were able to test it with our guided drilling. Um, I tried to keep it short and sweet, but this is the team. Myself, I'm uh, my co-founder and I, Daniel, have a personal history in mining because both our families are from the industry, but we have both have a deep background in AI. And in my particular case, I have a deep background in quantum physics. That was my job prior to working with Stratum. We also have a deep um, bench in terms of mining expertise. David is our geologist. He's been working with us for quite a while. Michelle Ash has been an industry advisor since the very beginning. And we employ a number of geologists and mine engineers to help us make sure that our quality standards for resource modeling and our control are always up to par. So, as I said, I try to keep it short and sweet. We are Stratum, and we create better resource models using the data you have. Thank you very much, Farzi. Um, great presentations, everyone. I would love it if we could all turn our cameras on now so I can start in with the Q&A, because I'm going to pick on all of you equally. Um, so. All of you were invited here because you're pushing the boundaries in your respective areas of focus, and you've all touched on that in your presentations. I want to delve a bit deeper and hear a bit more if you can tell me about what makes your products different from anything that might be similar on the market. So let's start with Michelle this time. Right, so the Geologger is very portable. It's a an easy to handle machine that can get into um, you know, any kind of logging, drill core logging facility without disrupting workflow. And um, that's definitely a, a major advantage when you don't want, you don't want to kind of come in and, and, and have the world kind of, you know, adjust to you. We just want to come in and, and, and scan drill core. So um, that's, its form is one um, um, important thing about it. And also the results it produces are very accurate and very precise and um, which is validated by um, external data sets. So portability and accuracy, two mm -hmm. very useful things for sure. And then Farzi, how would you answer that question? Yeah, uh, what I would, I think the easiest way to explain it is that we have created a new industry standard for our resource modeling. Um, the whole system of doing creaking is very interpolative in nature, where you have your drill hole samples and then you interpolate between them. Ours is more extrapolative in nature, it is more holistic as well. And because of that, those particular features, we are actually very good at ground fills exploration. We're also exceedingly good at work control because we can really get to the granularity of the geology and we can really capture those complex geological patterns within the data by using our AIs. So it's extrapolative, holistic, and your 
addressing multiple aspects of the process. Oh, and the data that they we use whatever data the mine has. We don't ask. We don't collect it. That's a big one. Yeah, and that can that can be a, a big deal too because um, for mines that don't have the ability to collect data, we exactly. just take what they have. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Um, and then pioneer exploration. How would you? I mean, you you talked about this quite a bit in your presentation. From my understanding, you're kind of at this point more of a complement to manned aircrafts and helicopters than a replacement for them. Is is that accurate? And is there anything that you would add in terms of what makes your solution different from anything else that's available? Uh, yeah, for sure. That's uh, that's totally. Uh, that's totally correct. Right now, UAV surveys sort of fill a gap between uh, terrestrial and manned aircraft um, in terms of survey scale and spatial resolution. Battery and even gas-powered drones are still not capable of competing with manned aircraft in terms of flight time and coverage per day for a survey. So just as they can't, just as we can't get as close to the ground as a person with a magnetometer backpack. So we kind of exist in the middle in between those. We're sort of a, a medium scale solution. Um, what we can do is we can fly lower to the ground than manned aircraft and pr produce higher resolution data in a, in a way that is safer because we're taking the pilot out of the aircraft. Um, we're finding ways to become more and more competitive for larger and larger scale surveys against manned aircraft. But at the end of the day, at a certain scale, the manned aircraft will always be a more cost effective solution for a large uh, large, large, uh, lower resolution survey. Got it. So really um, addressing greater accuracy in those areas where manned aircrafts are, are not as, as, as practical. Absolutely. It's, yeah. it's more about picking targets where we want a higher resolution data product and, and illuminating those, those smaller scale targets. Good stuff. And so another thing you all have in common is that your technologies are addressing, obviously, major challenges in mineral exploration. What do you see as some of the challenges coming down the pipeline in the future for uh, exploration and mining companies? So maybe we'll start with Farzi this time. For exploration companies, I think being able to examine large swaths of land with good data is the hardest piece having good data, calibrating collect correctly, and making sure it's calibrated across the entire process while you're correct. collecting data is a really hard piece. The more we can remove the environment out of this, the better. Um, you can also sort of correct with it with your instruments. I think um, going forward, that will be the benchmark in which all models that are built on top of this are created. Okay, and then moving to hyperspectral intelligence, what do you see as the future challenges in your area? I think, um, you know, you know, <clears throat> last year, perhaps, if you were to walk down the floor, um, you know, at PDAC, you see a, a huge amount of technology available. And I think there are a lot of companies, small and large, are feeling this kind of technology oversaturation, where not only are there new technologies coming out, there are multiple service providers for each type of technology. And so it's, it's you know, in the old days, you could kind of, you know, you knew which thin section lab would prepare your particular samples, how you like them. And so now it's kind of an order of magnitude more complex. Now you have to pick technology, you have to pick a service provider, and you need to, you know, know that the results coming in or validate the results coming in as being useful. Once you have that data collected, you have to then store it. So you need good data stewardship. This is particularly challenging with multiple different types of data sets coming in, different calibrations, and then paying for that storage. So if you have large amounts of data coming in, what's the long-term plan for that? And then finally, having somebody on hand who doesn't just know how the technology works, but has an extremely good background in mineralogy and geology so that the results coming back aren't just you know, trends or lines, but there's an actual chemical explanation for what's happening and that then can then be related to the downstream activities that are happening. So a lot of complexity, both in terms of selecting a technology and in implementing it, is mm -hmm. what I'm hearing there. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, Pioneer, I don't believe I've, oh, yeah, no, Pioneer, did you have a chance to answer this one yet? Uh, no, not yet. <laughs> um, okay. I just wanted to, yeah, for, for, for us mostly, um, and for, I, I believe, our clients, our clients are coming uh, to us with much more, um, remote areas to survey. 
And, and so that is kind of a, uh, the next step or the next evolution in, in drone surveying. And what we kind of touched on in the talk was how do we become more competitive with maybe a fixed wing or, or a manned aircraft? And these very remote areas that our clients have, they might not be uh, very large areas. And so they might be small and might not be uh, efficient for a fixed wing aircraft to do. So uh, one major exploration um, hurdle is going to be how do we collect the data that we're collecting now in these uh, very remote areas and, and how do we get there and how do we make it safe, you know, in terms of, of airspace, in terms of our crew and, and how we go about doing that. Yeah, I can see how that would be challenging collecting data in those increasingly remote areas for sure. So um, what do you guys see then, and maybe we'll start with hyperspectral intelligence this time, what do you see as the path to overcoming those challenges in, in your area? Sorry, what was, I, can you repeat the question? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, what do you see as the path to overcoming the challenges that you mentioned, which had to do oh. with complexity of collecting right. and implementing the technology? I think it comes down to, um, you know, the next generation of geologists that are coming out the, through the universities, not just geologists, but the, you know, the, the technical assistants that they, that they have and that, um, that there's a focus on obviously the fundamentals of geology and mineralogy and chemistry, but also lots of experience with, um, digital platforms, how to manage this data and then how to leverage it into, into moving forward. So education, really, then, mm -hmm. so that they can come into the workforce and handle this deluge of complex yes. stuff. Yes. Yeah. Um, so uh, pioneer exploration, how, what do you see as some of the, the routes to overcoming the issues with uh, or the, the challenges around remote data collection? Mm -hmm, for sure. So so for us, um, you know, I think it's going to be a lot of working with the regulators in terms of Transport Canada and uh, really getting into the nitty gritty of, you know, beyond visual line of sight uh, flights. So right now we're kind of regulated to visual line of sight, which we have to keep the drone uh, within line of sight of where we're flying it from um, to collect all of our data. And, and I think going forward, um, and trying to find or trying to explore these new areas in remote, uh, very remote um, areas that we will have to work with the regulators as well as, um, you know, making sure that we have a drone that can fly, uh, you know, long endurance, multiple hours uh, in, a, in a safe way and, and beyond kind of visual line of sight um, is, I think, how we're going to get there. So I, I'm hearing there's two pieces there then. There's the technical piece in terms of the, the drone actually being able to go where it needs to go for long enough and also the regulatory piece, which is going to require some collaboration. Correct. Yeah, the, the, the drone technology is ever increasing. I mean, it has come out of almost nowhere in the past 10 years. Um, but uh, of course, I think you know, there's going to be a lot more needed in terms of uh, uh, flight time, you know, payload capacity. And, and this comes down to, you know, battery power. And, and I think batteries will be in our lives for quite a bit uh, into the future. Um, and so I think we will get there. Uh, it, and I think we're, we're racing towards it now. Sounds like. And then uh, Farzi from Stratum AI, how are you looking to overcome the, the challenges in terms of the, I think, data availability was one of the main issues that you were talking about? Yeah, uh, that is actually the core of why the business was created. Um, we knew that data collection was an issue for lots of different minds because either they don't have the funds or it was just collected so long ago that it didn't matter then as it does now. Because as you probably know, the cost for running a mine is just becoming higher and higher and being able to be, still be profitable in these conditions is getting harder and harder. So that was the crux of our design our design of the AI itself to basically do the heavy lifting that our, the geologists can't. And we've demonstrated this on the most complex of deposits. We're talking quartz reefs in South Africa where you have 78 veins going in different orientations. Being able to isolate those veins, make sure they're within one to two meters, which is sort of the archetype of this type of deposit, and having them follow, have that continuity is really difficult and it took us a long time to get it right but once we got a, got it right the improvement in the accuracy of the model was so stark 
that we couldn't just stop. We had to keep going. And this is like, as data collection gets better, we know that we'll get better. And we, but I guess the, the reason the business existed was to tackle this exact problem. So you're working into the AI itself, the ability to handle data quality and quantity issues. Oh, absolutely. We've seen some truly horrendous stuff. Yeah, <laughs> us too in a completely different area. Yeah, very yeah. similar in that, in that sense. So, okay, let's turn it over to questions from the audience now, uh, if there are any. And the very kind folks from the Trade Commissioner Service, we're going to be keeping an eye on those. So let's just see if anything is coming through here. Give it a second. Nothing yet. Any questions for our panel from the audience? You can pop them into the Q&A. It's on the right-hand side of your screen there. We'll give it. Maybe one more minute here. Okay, so I've got one here for uh, Stratum AI and hyperspectral intelligence. If a company is interested in your solution but does not have deep AI knowledge, would you provide support slash guidance in applying your AI solutions to a particular project? So, um, sure. Can I go first? Yeah, go for it, thanks. Yeah, um, in terms of the heavy lifting of the AI, we take on a lot of that responsibility. It is our job to make sure that QPs understand what's going on underneath the hood. So if they wanted to reproduce this, say for example, for an NI43 for a JORC Jor uh, report, then that metadata, that supplementing data that our AI produces, as well as the actual data itself would be given to them so that they feel confident in knowing that this, this data has been quality controlled. And the really nice thing is that when we've tested this, this model out, we don't test it over six months. We test it over years and years of data prior so that you feel confident even before going into this that, you, that you're going to get something worthwhile. So you're providing evidence of your accuracy before they even really get into it. And absolutely. And then they also get that, that supporting data to report on it, which is, I think, a big concern that most geologists have. Thought it makes sense. Um, and hyperspectral intelligence, that one was for you as well, Michelle. Yeah, so um, all of data processing is included um, with the geologger unit. So there, it really is um, very easy. In, uh, tool to implement and in the sense that you know when you have an XRF you have the raw counts and you have the raw data and then you have data coming out it's a similar thing so you have the hyperspectral data would be considered this very raw data but the outputs that you get are telling you the different compositions of the rocks that are there and you don't need to have a background in hyperspectral data to to understand what's going on but it's always nice to have people who've used um, previous you know like TerraSpecs or Halos who are then using the machines that kind of understand the, the, the principles and the physics behind it. So for people who don't understand the principles, they can get the insights and see the value. For people who do understand them, they can verify that that is actually something that they should believe in. Well, all of the results are validated with external data sets. So there's really um, this validation process is critical to the deployment of these machines. And um, and they are producing, you know, they produce accurate results in the context of the of the deposit itself. And so the the people using it as in specific the operators, it's nice when the operators have a background, have used other equipment, any kind of equipment before. But the results coming out, you do not have to have a hyperspectral background to use them. Got it. OK. So another question is, is anyone having to deal with clients' cybersecurity concerns with cloud-based information sharing? Um, so I'll just throw it out to the group and see who wants to grab it first. Michelle? Right. So, um, yeah, so there are, there are many ways that you can um, protect data. And having that secure tra data transfer, and that's something that we deal with on a regular basis and is built into the, into the system. Obviously, um, transferring data is very important. And um, it's important that it's taken care of properly. 
Okay. Um, anyone else want to tackle that before I've got a few more questions still here? So. Sure, I'll take that. I think that's relevant to us. So okay. while we tackle it the normal way, we are PIPA certified. We use a cloud service that has a cybersecurity built in. If you're afraid of that, has a cloud provider, we have gone as far as emailing the resource model to your secure service in order to make sure you're protected. Because at the end of the day, what if we deliver to you in the format you want, you're more likely to use it. So from that perspective, right? But from that perspective, like if you're delivering us the data via email, then we'll pop it out to you in a CSV or in a format you choose, depending on your mining visualization, visualization software that you like, can pop it out to you that way. If you like something more continuous, then we have a system for that. If you want to test, sort of put your feet in the water, we'll email it to you if that's what you want. So lots, lots of options there. Um, another question here for hyperspectral intelligence. Could satellite imagery provide added value to bridge the gap and challenges mentioned with respect to remote areas? Are the hyperspectral slash multispectral sensors on satellites as effective as the sensors to drones, UAVs, et cetera? Um, that's a big question. Um, we work with all kinds of hyperspectral data that are coming in, so we have uh, extreme domain expertise in in um, airborne satellite systems um, and systems that go on drones in addition to point sensors. And so any kind of hyperspectral data that is coming in can be used in combination with other types of hyperspectral or multiband data that's coming in. So there is no, um, as long as the data collected are well calibrated and appropriate for that scenario, then there's no reason why you can't be leveraging all, all data sets together as a cohesive group. Okay. Um, and as a follow-up, I'm getting lots of uh, questions for hyperspectral. Um, <laughs> are you looking to expand into uh, XRF, say, to find gold? Um, there are lots of XRF suppliers out now, so you can go and select from there. We find that the XRF has a tendency to um, perhaps slow the geologger down. In addition, we're not really comfortable with the X-rays at this point. At this, with the geologger right now, it's completely safe. There's no um, radiation, and um, it's very easy to ship overseas. And adding the XRF component is not something that's on our uh, agenda at this moment. Yeah. So it sounds like you're really looking more to to do things that are that are not already kind of a bit e easily. Done. There's a lot of options available for XRF, and so they can be used in conjunction with the geologger, but we are not, we don't have plans to put an XRF on the geologger. Okay. Um, so this is one for pioneer exploration. Using drones for hyperspectral analysis, uh, it was stated that drones provide benefits from a spatial resolution perspective, question mark. What level of spatial resolution do most applications require? Uh, yeah, I, I think I can actually answer that one. Uh, but basically, like there is uh, there is this the achievable spatial resolution that uh, that uh, is what defines or like what what makes UAVs unique in these terms. Like let's say like for satellites, it's like something between four to sometimes ninety meters because there are like a lot of satellites either are already in orbit or uh, they have there have been like satellite missions uh, in the past. Uh, aircrafts are usually in the scale of like two to five to sometimes seven to ten meters. Helicopters they can go a little bit closer and uh, fly slower, and that actually makes it to half a meter maybe like a minimum. But UAVs have the achievable spatial resolution of three centimeters to one meter, depending on the type of sensor that you're using. But what actually like makes the big difference here is the spectral resolution too, which is uh, three to ten nanometers right now with the sensors uh, capable of being carried by the UAVs. And that actually like uh, makes a huge, huge difference than uh, the satellites that were uh, in the orbit or are in the orbit, which uh, give us uh, uh, 10 to 100 nanometer of spectral resolution. So that's, uh, you see like where the difference is and what UAVs uh, can do, which cannot be done from the orbit. And that's, that's something that, uh, we really want to uh, put the focus on, and uh, I, I believe that that's our selling point uh, 
when it comes to um, dealing with hyperspectral imaging. So you're providing a higher degree of spatial resolution and, and it would be high enough, you would say, that um, it would fit the needs of most applications? Exactly. For mirror exploration applications, what you need is basically like the, the reflectance of uh, certain spectrums uh, when it comes to um, uh, detecting that type of mineralization. And when it comes to um, detecting, uh, let's say, uh, halos like uh, uh, geochemical uh, or geochemistry uh, halos for uh, uh, detecting alteration zones that actually like becomes extremely important and especially if you don't have vegetation to cover up that reflection so uh, yeah we're actually like uh, really excited about uh, this new method that we are trying to offer our clients okay so i got another one for stratum here and so maybe I'll ask that one. Is your modeling 43101 or JORC compliant to report resources? Any challenges there? Um, and simple answer to the question is no, no challenges there. Uh, sorry, not no to the being compliant piece, but the no to no challenges. So it is, yeah, we can report with this. So I'll just sort of build off the last answer I gave. What we do, because you are using the data you already have, you have that data to be able to report on. In terms of what types of metadata you need to be able to create the, to basic, basically create an estimation for the report, um, we export that and just and give it to you. So all that data is there for you to look at. You should be able to recreate it on your own um, with that data. It will take much longer, but you should be able to recreate it. So as an example, uh, if I have a gold data, if I have a gold mine and they have drill holes and some chip samples, we would only use the drill holes because that's what estimation allows. But we would also provide you with the AI wireframe in which your theorems or domains would section out the area that you're trying to report on. So you would have those wireframes, you'd have that data, you should be able to reproduce that on any mining software to to make yourself happy. But all that information is all there for you. So yeah, no challenges there. Lots of options for reporting, okay. Um, so here is another one. As your technology is now commercialized and turned into a successful business, and I think this is a question for everyone, how do you balance maintaining your business operations as well as continued innovation and research to stay at the top of your field? I can uh, start with that one. I think <laughs> I think for a lot of us, for, for uh, Miki and Andrew, it's um, a lot of uh, late nights and and working uh, weekends <laughs> because uh, it, it's ex whoever asked that is is exactly correct in, in assuming that it gets fairly tough for us if we're uh, you know especially for the past uh, year or so you know we've been out in the field we've all been out in the field collecting the data ourselves and so it's hard to do a lot of research and development um, when we're all when we're also in the field um, collecting the data the great thing about that is that every project that we're on is is so different and there's so many different um, problems that we have to solve and so many issues that come up that it allows us to almost um, evolve as as we're as we're collecting you know these this data and and doing these surveys um that being said you know we are working more towards uh we've you know hired more people and so that we've have more field uh operatives in, uh flying the surveys and then we can have our guys back in the office and and doing the more research and development uh sort of things that we're really looking into uh into completing so in your case, it's a really a, a matter of managing your resources, your internal resources, and making sure that everybody's doing the right thing at the right time and, and taking advantage of sort of like uh, double duty, learning as you go, kind of. Exactly. Yeah, we tr really try to strive for everybody in the company to kind of know how to do everything. Uh, and, and that's going from, you know, data processing to infield operations to just the logisticals of, uh, of, of how each survey works or, or, or how we, um, you know, how we get out into the field and, and collect that data. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's a lot of, uh, you know, we have a ton of great ideas and, and it's just, it's just getting down and, and, and getting to it and, and testing it. And I mean, that also kind of works into um, kind of the regulation space as well, where, you know, 
we have to kind of find spaces to fly and to test out these new uh, these new technologies um, and even just small little things on our drones as well. And so being able to go to like you know a field a specific field that's uh, that's regulated to to fly the drones um, whenever we can is, has been has been great. And there's a bunch of different uh, fields around uh, where we are, so that's been that's been really helpful. Okay, um, and I'll see if uh, Farzi or Michelle wants to take a stab at that one, and then we've got one more question, and I'll get you all to share how people can get in touch with you. Yeah, so, so uh, I'll, I'll go. Um, so, I mean, one of the things to balance the, the innovation versus, you know, deployment, I guess, is to really stay focused on what the customers are asking for. Um, we come from, you know, traditionally a, a traditional research background, you know, working in the lab. And so there can be this tendency to kind of you get to do what you want to do what you want to do. But um, the reality is that, you know, the customers want very specific things. And if you focus on what they want, then then you can um, um, definitely slow, um, speed up the amount of time that it takes to make equipment and to make software. If you just listen to what the customers are asking for. Yeah, absolutely. Getting that customer feedback and iterating based on that is is really crucial for sure. Uh, and then Farzi, did you want to um, take a run at that one before we do the last question? Yeah, yeah. Um, very simply, you know, in our case, we've, in terms of deploying um, the software onto multiple mines, um, we've automated a lot of that process. So once we've actually tested out the models, we've got something optimal, and we're now updating it with new data and doing um, runs to check the quality control, all of that code has been created to automate that process. So that leaves us some time to do the research that we want to do. Our clients do dictate, help us dictate what we want to do. For example, with the gold mine that we are, that I mentioned during my presentation, the drill hole simulator that we call internally was born, where we used various constraints on the mine site, including infrastructure, dopes, um, the location of stopes, the actual clusters themselves to find the most optimal drill hole pattern to guide their drilling process. So a lot of that is being done with the clients. And as time goes on, we believe that for every new client we onboard, especially in long term, we can start tackling those really specific problems because ultimately they will always come back to the resource model in some way. So if we can tackle that for them, then that also almost inherently increases our ability to keep up with everybody's game. So again, um, really getting that customer feedback and uh, mm -hmm. automating as much as possible. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so last question, and this one I'm assuming is for Pioneer Exploration, is hydrogen fuel being looked at for drones? And maybe a super quick answer on this one, if, if you have one. Well, we're actually looking at um, some options in terms of like, you know, being uh, being able to use the drones for longer. Uh, but like the endurance of the drone has always been a problem and a challenge for us as, as you know, like the drones that we are using are battery based and uh, it's uh, like the battery technology is not there yet to fly like multiple hours, but uh, there has been some uh, really uh, lucrative solutions uh, out there in, uh, uh, in the industry, mostly in like research uh, uh, state at this point. Uh, I have heard about the hydrogen one, uh, but uh, I think uh, it, it still has like a little bit of uh, time until we can uh, reliably put our sensors on a hydrogen based drone uh, and uh, make sure that it's not going to crash into the ocean or um, uh, somewhere with uh, uh, with that kind of difficulty. But um, uh, there are hybrid drones for sure that have like a generator on board that provides like longer endurance for, for the drone. But uh, we have to actually make sure that when we are switching to a platform like that, uh, we are not introducing more noise or more uh, unwanted data to the sensor on board, right? So it's just like we need to make sure that uh, since we are switching the platform or just adding something else to the platform, the data is gonna continue to be as clean as possible so when we are processing the data afterwards and uh, therefore giving it to the client, uh, everything is uh, as it was before and no extra noise is being introduced to the data. So yeah, putting a generator of any kind or like if it's like uh, hydrogen fuel or like uh, gas powered, it, 
it has challenges like that that needs to be taken into the account. And yes, we have uh, ideas in mind to um, to put this or to actually like employ these new techniques into our fleet. So really keeping an eye on what's out there and making sure that it's going to be reliable enough and uh, maintain the integrity of the data before you actually implement exactly. that is what I'm hearing there. Yeah. All we want are um, happy flights, not like uh, not necessarily like uh, long flights. Right. Okay. So, um, how can people get in touch with all of you? Let's start with uh, Farzi this time. Sure. You can uh, go through our website, stratum.ai. Pretty simple. You can also email us directly, founders at stratum.ai. So, pretty easy to find us. And of course, if you want to find me specifically, then my first name, Farzi, F A R Z I, and stratum.ai. Oh, also awesome. Well. And Michelle. Okay, <laughs> lots of options. Um, so, Michelle, yeah. how, how can people get in touch with you? Well, uh, the same way. Our name is a bit more complex, though. Um, yeah, www.hyperspectralintelligence.com with a dash in between hyperspectral intelligence um, on LinkedIn and email. Email, you can person my first name, Michelle, at hyperspectral intelligence.com. And uh, Pioneer Exploration, if people want to know more, what do they do? For sure, they can go and see our uh, website, pioneerexploration.ca. Um, as well, we're on LinkedIn, all the social media, Facebook, Instagram. Um, you can uh, look us up there. You can message us on LinkedIn personally if you'd like, uh, or you can just go to the our, our main email, which is info at pioneerexploration.ca. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everyone. This has been a fantastic discussion. I would really encourage all of the attendees to check out details in this series. They're all going to be great. Um, if you want to know more about Rhythmic, I'm going to be on a panel for PDAC on Wednesday at 5.30 Eastern on digitization and innovation in mining. So hope to see you there as well. And thank you so much again for coming. Take care, everyone. Bye. All right. Thank you.